everybody. Uh, um, hi, my name is Keith Stanton. I'm the managing partner of uh, Votive Leadership, a uh, performance-based organization. Um, in my life, I've had the great privilege to work with an awful lot of uh, high-performing professionals, be they from the world of sport or indeed from the world of business. Uh, and this has given me the, the opportunity to have a look at some of the insights of what is the difference that makes the difference between the average performer and the extraordinary performer. You know that person who just goes down to the pub, um, they just seem to have the best friends, they seem to be able to get the, the best relationships and everyone likes them. You know, what are they doing? Why are they so different to everybody else? Why are they able to, to get it? Is it just luck or do they make that luck? What is it? And what we've been able to identify some very simple key strategies. Now in this talk, I've got three very simple goals. First one of those is value. Uh, if I'm going to spend up about uh, 20 minutes or 30 minutes of your time, then I've got to bring a whole bunch of value to the proceedings. Now, I know that what I'm going to talk about today has got immense value because this is life skill stuff. This is applicable to everybody in the audience, doesn't matter who you are or where you work with. But it's very easy to come and, and sit in front of here or what have you, or walk around the place with what I'd say the invisible cynical hat firmly placed on top of your head. You can't see the hat, but you tend to see the body language that goes with it. It's normally sat back in the chair, legs crossed, arms folded, beautifully demonstrated by the gentleman at the front here. Um, but don't worry. The, um, it's very, so I, let me tell you a little story, actually. I, I was very fortunate. I worked with a, um, a group of... Uh, from a charity called Alcoholics Anonymous. I wasn't a delegate, I hasten to add. I was, uh, I was one of the, um, uh, working with the councillors. And one of the councillors had uh, been across to America and had just come back and said, I've got this great metaphor I want to show you. It's a brilliant metaphor, it's great. And what he did was um, he brought them into a room, made everyone sit down, and brought with himself two tumblers of clear liquid and sort of plonked them down in front of the group and pulled out of his pocket a tin, opened up the tin, and pulled out of the tin a live earthworm. And he got this worm and he dropped it into the first tumbler of clear liquid. Now that contained water. Now the worm was quite happy, sort of bath time, swam around a little bit, not a bother. But then he fished out the worm and dropped it into the second tumbler of clear liquid. Now that contained neat alcohol. Now I don't know if any of you have actually tried this experiment at home. Uh, if you have, I suggest you get therapy. Because basically what happens is the worm dissolves, disappears. A bad day for the worm but a hell of a way to go when you think about it. But anyway, he turns around to this group of, uh, from Alcoholics Anonymous in front of me. He says, look, this contains water. This contains neat alcohol. What does it say to you? And it's the most impactful way to start the proceedings because the group are sat there going, Jesus, I didn't realize the power of alcohol. What's happening to my insides? And a really good discussion ensued. But there was one very dour Yorkshire farmer in the group, and he was sat there, obviously not engaged, obviously not motivated, his arms folded, sat back in the back of the room. And the counselor decided to engage him and said, so you don't seem to be with it. And the guy said, no, 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 no. I don't quite see it that way, to be perfectly honest. What that says to me is that if I keep drinking the way I am doing, I'm never going to suffer from worms. Which was a great way of looking at it, but it was a great illustration that value is whichever way you choose to look at it. And life is exactly the same. Whichever way you choose to look at performance will determine how much you get out of that. So that's the core value that I have for today. So what is that difference that makes the difference between the average person and the real peak performer? Now here's an interesting question. Got a bit of an audience here. Um, I'm not a wealthy man, but I'm gonna, uh, there's, there's a bit of money here. Let's have a look, what do we got? Yeah, we got one of these. Um, so 10 pound, Any, anybody here would like more money? Anybody would like more money? We obviously have a lot of wealthy people here because not a lot of hands going up in the air. Okay, would anyone like more money now, today? Fantastic. There's 10 pound here, it's yours. All you've got to come up here and do something for me. This could be one of the shortest speeches I've ever given in my life or what have you. Fantastic. There you go. All I'd like you to do is shake my hand and congratulate you. Well done. Thank you very much indeed. Ten pound better off. There you go. Found a round of applause for him. There he is. Worthwhile for him coming. Now, it's very interesting because when I asked the question, I had lots and lots of hands go up in the air. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I want more money. I want more money. Uh, do you want it now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I want it now. You've got to come up here and do something. Whoa, 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 whoa. No. Nobody moved. Now, I don't know whether he's from Yorkshire or Scotland or whatever it is, but, but it's, how many people here talk to themselves? Yeah, we all do, don't we? We all talk to ourselves. And some, the worrying ones, the ones who stand in the audience and go, do I talk to myself? 
No, I don't think I do. Maybe I do sometimes. I'm not sure. But okay, we all talk to ourselves. We all have a little language going on inside our heads. Something rattling away. Um, and that little voice determines our performance ultimately at the end of the day. There's a very simple um, uh, formula here. Potential minus interference equals performance. And that interference can manifest itself in two forms, either external, so it could be things like weather, the politics, the marketplace, the technology that you have, but it, most of that interference that determines performance in an individual is down here. It's inside the head. It's what's going on. The language that is being said. Everybody in this audience could have been 10 pound better off, and all you had to do was come up here and squash that little voice that was saying, don't go up there. Don't go up there. He'll get you to do something daft. Oh no, sit back down. I mean, would we accept that from our own salespeople, our business developers? Would we accept that behavior where they don't come up, they don't make that phone call? How much action are you not taking in your lives as a consequence of that voice? Now, if we are able to alter that voice so that it is working for us, helping us to actually develop and grow, giving us the courage and able to step forward, how much more action would we take? And as a consequence of taking that action, how much more results would we attain? How much more would we achieve as a consequence of just going out, just by controlling that voice? What is it that prevented us from operating, preventing us from being 10 pound better off? When I go around and ask people, you know, what are the attributes of a peak performer, I often get some different replies. And I, I tend to, in my workshops, ask this question. Imagine that you are going to be replaced in the workplace, that your organization is allowing you to go on holiday wherever you want to go in the world. You can go away for 12 months, all expenses paid. The only problem is you have to replace yourself here in the workplace. And if you have to, you have to replace yourself with a peak performer. Because that person, how they perform, will determine how long you're on holiday for and indeed how much money you're going to be given as the spending money. But the only way you can replace yourself is by running an advert in a local newspaper and you've got 10 slots to put down the key attributes. And when I ask them to list those, those attributes, I get a list. I get a list of a team player, has to be active, um, has to be enthusiastic, has to have passion, has to be a great communicator, good customer skills. And we get this list and we keep going down that list. And when you boil it down, the list can be divided into two areas. The list will either be skill sets or they'll be mindsets. Things like passion, energy, drive. And when you look at that list, no matter how many times I do it, no matter what organization, whether it's a Premier League football team, whether it is a high computer programming organization or a direct sales organization, the split always ends the same roughly around 80% down to attitude, to mindset, and 20% down to the skill set. Which is interesting and fascinating when you look at our corporate training budgets. Where do we spend our time training? On skills. We keep going on skills courses and skills training, and yet the difference that makes the difference is the attitude side. And people say, can you train that? Of course you can train that. You ask a sports person, they spend hours, hours every single day ensuring that they are able to get their mindset right. The skill set is, is difference at the high level is minute. I mean, does anybody here play golf at all? Yeah? You can tell, by the way, they put their hand up how good a golfer they are, by the way. You know, this is a quite competent. This is cross-country hockey player. Um, so now, whether you play golf or not, you can relate to this, um, this story. Imagine, a bit difficult today, but imagine a beautiful sunny day. You're on a putting green. You've got a two-foot putt, um, great big bucket of balls next to you. Nobody's watching you. Would you get 50% of them in? Probably would. But now take that shot again to win the Open. You've got 40,000 people all staring at you. They've all just gone totally silent just to help you concentrate. You've got about 10 million viewers all tuned on and a million quid resting on that shot. Would you still be able to get 50% of them in under that kind of pressure? No way. If you think about who the number one golfer is in the world and the number 100 golfer in the world, if you were number 100 in the world in your profession, you're going to be pretty damn good but you look at the earnings difference between the number 100 and the number one. Is that a skill difference? I don't think so. The difference is, is the number one is able to access that skill more consistently. When the pressure is on, when the trouble is there, the difficulties are there, they are able to tap into it, to overcome all those interferences that are happening inside their mind, all that stuff that affects them and 
access their best performance. And we look at this in a very simple model here. Because what we notice is that the way that you feel at any moment in time, the emotion that you have, determines your behavior. And your behavior ultimately determines your results. Now, the problem with this model, I mean, that's very straightforward. Um, if you feel happy, you're going to behave in a very different way to if you feel angry. Um, and you're going to get a very different result if you're behaving with happiness or behaving with anger. But the difference here is that most average people work from the outside of this model in. They allow the result to determine the way that they feel, as opposed to the peak performer who is able to operate from the inside out. So I'll give you an example. If you get a good result at work, how do you feel? You feel pretty good, don't you? Feel at a 10. And because you're feeling good, and you've got two or three meetings to go to that afternoon, how do you behave in those meetings? really well. Have you ever found yourself when you're feeling really great, you go into a meeting and you start talking and you have to stop yourself and you go, God, did I say that? Wow, I'm good. Yeah, you ever had those sort of moments? And hopefully you're going to get another decent result. But sometimes, of course, life isn't as fair as that. Sometimes, no matter how good you're feeling and even if you're doing and saying the right things, you cannot always rely upon getting the right result. And of course, sometimes you get a bit of bad luck something goes wrong. And when you get a bad result, what happens to the way that you feel? That takes a little trip down towards the one end of the scale. And we start to feel bad. And what happens then? That bad mood affects our behavior. And that behavior uh, knocks on and affects our results. But the problem is we drag that mood with us throughout the whole day. You know, there are some people, I don't know whether you have these in your own organizations, but they hold plum parties. Lots and lots of plum parties. A plum party is a poor little old me party. And they're going around the organization, God, saying, oh, you won't believe the rubbish that happened to me today. Do you know that customer? No, they never did anything. I, 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 all that. And the management, they've asked me to do all this, and I'm going to fit all that in. You tell him what sort of shit day I'm having. Hello, mate. God, you won't believe the crap day I'm having today. Oh, it's a nightmare. I've got all this dumped on me, and I'm meant to do all that. Hello? Oh, hello, sweetheart. No, you won't believe the shit day I'm having today. It's a nightmare. It really is. And they invite everybody into their plum party to make sure that they spread the depression and misery around the whole place. I mean, the real nutters, the real nutters, they drag it home with them. They feel bad. They have a rubbish day at work. They take that mood. They open the front door, meow, kick the cat out the way, turn around to their partner and say, I couldn't give a stuff what sort of day you've had so far, sweetheart. It's going to be a shit one from here on in. And they take that mood with them home. Have you ever walked in at home and you've had a really bad day and you open up the door and you go, oh, I've had a bad day. And your partner says, oh, I've had a great day. Do you then go, oh, fantastic, let me join your party. No, you don't. You look them in the eye and go, well, you lucky sod. You want to see the crap that I've had. I've had this, I've had that, I've had that. And you lay it on them until they feel miserable. And when they feel miserable, you go, yeah. Now we're at one. Fantastic. And it's a trouble. We take that mood and we drag it with us. We drag it around the office. We operate, let the result dictate the way we feel. Whereas the peak performer, no, the peak performer, if they get a good result, feel great, behave fantastic, hopefully get another decent result. But if they get a bad result, they still drop down towards the one end of the scale. We're all connected to the result in the way that we feel. There's a word that describes people who are not connected to the result in the way we feel. It's called psychopaths. Well, hopefully we don't have any of those in the audience. But you know, So you're ultimately going to be affected. So they're going to feel bad, but they have the strategies, the mental wherewithal to lift themselves up in the moment. They're able to control their state, state management. They have those strategies. They do not allow the mood to drag beyond the one second more than it needs to. So, for example, Olympic Games, um, gold medal, high jump. The guy has spent five years training for this moment in time. He's in the final round, runs in for his first attempt. He's at a 10, feeling it as best he can. Got all the visualization, end of the runway, doing it all right, runs in. <laughs> Gets to the bar, whack, leaps over the bar, knocks the bar down. Damn it. Gets a bad result, not happy. He's not going to sit there and go, yeah, I've knocked the bar down, fantastic. He's going to feel rubbish. But he's got three minutes before he runs in for his second attempt. 
Where has he got to be on this scale of 1 to 10 to stand any chance of getting that gold medal? He's got to be back up to a 10. He can't be at a 9 or an 8 or a 7. He can't be anywhere there. He has to be back up to a 10 and only has three minutes to do that. Out here in our normal lives, when we're going around the place, stuff happens to us. Stuff knocks us down. But the danger is we drag that mood. We play from a 7. We play from a 6. We don't say, I need to play from a 10. Now, don't get me wrong. Don't get me wrong. It doesn't mean you have to be at a 10 every moment of every day. Sometimes you've worked bloody hard for your depression and misery, and you're going to suddenly well enjoy it, aren't you? And that's absolutely fine, so long as you do not need a result. And that is the next phone call. It might be the next meeting, the next person you're actually interacting with. It's when you need a result is the time you need to be able to shoot yourself up and play from that 10. So how do we do that? Well, understanding that driving your emotion is your beliefs. The language that you're saying to yourself, those little invisible rules that are going on inside your head. A belief is just a feeling of certainty, and it's a shortcut to the way that you feel. It instantaneously fires it off. I'll give you an example. A friend of mine phoned me up at Christmas and said, um, Keith, would you take me to the airport on, on Christmas Eve? Uh, we're going away on holiday. I said, yeah, 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 no bother, no bother. But the swine never told me that his flight was at 6 o'clock in the morning. Oh, oh, thanks for that, mate. So four o'clock, Christmas Eve morning, I'm driving up the motorway, drop him off at the airport, I'm driving back down. Road's empty, I'm speeding. Suddenly, woo, 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 in come behind me, blue flashing light. Now, what was my belief when I saw that blue flashing light? What feeling of certainty did I have? Was it a feeling that I was going to get a late Christmas present? No. Was it feeling there was a Christmas card about to be delivered? No. Was it a feeling that the officer was going to get out of the car and go, fantastic driving, well done? No. Instantaneously, I felt, I'm in the poo here. There's going to be some problems. Bit of a challenge. Um, and instantaneously, there was emotions of guilt and nervousness and worry. Bang, fighting, because that was the belief. That was what was going on inside my head. There's a little sub-anecdote to this story, actually, because I pulled to the side of the road, and I thought, come on, Keith, you're a talker. Um, you know, I've been told that honesty is a core value. And I thought, now, come on, see if we can get out of this. So I'm sat there in the car, and zzz, down goes the window. Along comes the officer, sticks his head through the window, and I dive straight in. I said, look, officer, I, I apologize. I know I was speeding, but I'm dashing home to pick up the kids for Christmas. And, and it is Christmas. Jingle bells, jingle bells. You know, season of goodwill to all men. And I wasn't going that fast, and the road was safe, especially for the car. And, and it is Christmas. And he looked at me, and he said, fascinating. Apparently, your friend has dropped his passport in the back of your car. But would you like to tell me a little bit more about this speeding that you're on about? True story, he'd left his passport in the back of the car. He'd, I didn't have my mobile phone. He phoned up my wife. My wife, in infinite wisdom, said, oh, phone the police. You never know. There can't be many cars like his driving down the road this time in the morning. So, hey, presto. So one less Christmas card that I'm going to be giving out this year, certainly to that friend anyway. But anyway, the feeling is a shortcut to the way that we feel. If you want to release, change your behavior, if you want to get more, you have to do something different. Because if you keep doing what you're doing, you're going to keep getting what you're getting. So you have to do something different different. Changing your behavior means you have to change down here at the belief level because we're built like an iceberg. We see the behavior. I can see the behavior of the people around here in this audience. You can see my behavior. But what is driving my behavior is my emotion. The emotion drives the behavior, but what is driving the emotion is the belief that is underneath that. Now, if you want to change your performance, be it of your team, of your organization, or yourself as an individual, then you have to operate at that level. What are the beliefs that are in existence in you, in your team, or in the organization? What are those rules that are there? And unless you challenge that, the change will be fleeting. The change will be angelic. It will not last. This is how the diet industry makes lots of money, by the way. And this is, I mean, this is a bit terrible to say this out here, but, but, but this is how they make money. Because what do they do? They just try to change your behavior. And that's all they do. They don't operate at the belief level. I mean, a friend of mine, he's got onto the cabbage soup diet. I don't know if any of you have ever come across that. Nothing but cabbage soup for two weeks. Now, he's lost a lot of weight, but he's lost a lot of friends. 
Because there's no way I'm going to be stood near him if he's had nothing but cabbage soup for two weeks. He's got a sign around his neck saying, no naked flames near me. Uh, the guy's a walking wind farm, a chemical factory. It isn't good. It's not pretty. But at the end of two weeks, he goes, look at me, super slim, lost all the weight, fantastic. What he's done is chopped the top off the iceberg. He's changed his behavior. But if you chop the top off an iceberg, what happens to the rest of the iceberg? It just floats up. It pushes up. And the old beliefs push through. So at the end of two weeks, having lost all the weight, he says, look at me. I can have the full fried breakfast because I've lost all the weight. I can have the full fish and chip for supper because I've lost all the weight. I can have the six or seven pints of Guinness because I've lost all the weight. Of course, two weeks later, he's put all the weight back on again. What does he say? Oh, I can't diet me. I've been on all the diets. They don't work. No, they just don't work for me. And the reason is because he hasn't changed his belief. And when you turn around and say, oh, I'm not performing, the customers aren't working for me, the product isn't doing, it's because you have not changed your belief. See, for example, I do not believe for one second that it is a difficult market out there. I, have no, I do not believe that for one moment that it is a difficult market. What I do believe is that it is a different market. Now, just look at the, to those two different beliefs and how whether one is empowering or limiting. Because if I see difficulty, how am I going to feel? If that's what the picture is going on inside my head and that's the language I'm talking to myself, what emotion am I going to have? We go, oh, it's going to be difficult. That call is going to be difficult. It's going to be difficult to sell that product. It'll be difficult to hit that target. What do I see? I see difficulty. I see barriers. I see everything that is in place that will stop me from achieving. Whereas if I said, hang on, no, it's a different market, what pictures are coming into my head now? Different market just says, I've got to be different. What are you doing differently in 2013 than what you did in 2012? What are you going to do different in 2014 to beat 2013? Because if you do exactly the same, you'll get the same. And you don't want the same, you want difference. So that allows me to access innovation, creativity. It allows me to access courage, to take risk, to be different. So long as I have that belief that it's a different market, it's not the same market. It's a different market that we're operating in. So understanding that, and that's a big topic, obviously, but that's where a lot of the sports people spend a lot of their time operating. Or what are those silly little things, that language, those invisible rules that are going on inside our heads? And just to look at these words on the screen, these are the six dominant fears that operate at that belief level where we are telling ourselves stories. The fear of failure, the fear of exposure, embarrassment, of conflict, of rejection and loss. Just look at those words and see how much they dominate your life. How much do they dominate your action? Whether you're choosing what to wear, who to go and talk to, when to go and talk to them, you know, what phone calls you're going to make, what critical conversations are you going to have with your boss, with a person who's, who's above you, with the people left and right of you who are not necessarily living to the values of your organization, holding them to account, giving feedback, or even just asking for feedback from the team. When was the last time you asked somebody in your corporate life, what do I need to learn in order to be a better person? Because without the answer to that question, how are you going to grow? But we don't ask that because I have fear of exposure, fear that I might be embarrassed, fear that I might be criticized and they end up with conflict and stuff like that, and fear of rejection. And just a simple question like that, and yet without the answer to that question, how can you grow? How can you develop? We have to be able to challenge that. Challenge the six fears. Why do we not achieve? Well, if when I talk to people and organizations and that, this is the answers I get. Well, I don't have enough money. I don't have enough time. If they just gave me a little bit more time, then I'd be fantastic. Then I'd be able to sell loads. If they gave me more support, a bit more admin, a little bit more uh, point of sale material, a little bit more marketing. If they gave me the staff, if they gave me people to work with, if they just improved the technology, Jesus, look at the technology. We're behind everybody else. We need a little bit more of this, a little bit more of that. You know, a better manager. If you just got rid of my manager, then I'd be fantastic, I can tell you. you know, if you get rid of him, then, then brilliant, I'll, I'll be fine, I'll, I'll, be, I'll be superb. You just want to get rid of that person. And if you just gave me a little bit more knowledge. And when you look at this, these are all resources. But that's not the reason you fail. That's not the reason why you don't achieve. No, not in the slightest. The reason that we do not achieve our true potential is very simply resourcefulness. 
Not resources, resourcefulness. Our ability to tap into passion, creativity, drive, energy, determination, innovation, curiosity. These are the things. If you look at a peak performer, somebody who's out there who's achieving, be it a corporate organization, be it a team, or indeed be it an individual, they have got bucket loads of this. And this allows them to be resourceful, to be creative, to be dynamic in that marketplace, and to achieve so much more as a consequence of that. And just to close off, to me, the most important word that sits out there is this very simple thing of passion. Because if you've got passion about whatever it is that you're doing, whoever you're working with, the technology, the team that you're in, just passion for life, then it comes out in your body language, it comes out in your eyes, it comes out in the way that you move, in the language that you talk about, and you attract people. And people like to be around people who are passionate, who have got that energy. It is attractive. You cannot give what you do not have. I've met many a sales manager, for example, who sits there and says, go on, get out there and be motivated. Go on, make that call. I mean, it's just not going to work, is it? Imagine if I stood up here at the beginning today and said, you know, hi, welcome. Today I'm going to talk to you about peak performance. Uh, it's going to be a bit of fun. Shit. And, um, I mean, you'd be sat there going, who the hell's this? Okay, a couple of you would have been stood there going, sounds good to me. I quite like that guy, actually, I don't know why. But that's just, um, that's just rapport. But at the end of the day, there has to be passion. Because if you've got it, you can give it. And people will buy it. And just my final comment is, remember how that word is spelled. Pass, I, on. Because that's what it's down to. We as a human being are a wonderful creature that have got so much inside of us, so much potential. We are scratching the surface. But if you are able to tap into emotion, tap into that energy, and tap into passion, you just pass it on. And what a better place this world would be if we didn't have the plum party organizers, we didn't have the naysayers, the moaners, the people who are saying, you can't, you can't, you can't, you can't, it won't happen, that's no good, oh, you won't be any good at that. How much better place would it be if we just had people who had so much more passion to give to us, to lift us, and to drive us, and to give us that energy? I think it would be a much, much better place and a much more powerful place for each and every one of us, and we'd all be more successful. Thank you very much indeed.